I'm on the downhill side of bronchitis, but I don't want to get near y'all. In fact, when I do, I'm going to have my mask on. Just to be precaution. It's not any fun when you got to uh, spit up those large, disastrous things that come out of your bronchial tubes. <coughs> Y'all been through that before? Well, today we're going to have the Lord's Supper communion. It's uh, a time that we should get real serious with our relationship with Christ. Because after all, look at all he did for us to have the privilege and the right to do this today. So Jesus stressed this importance. <coughs> and uh, the Corinthian church was doing it carnally. They weren't doing it spiritually. So Paul had to write a letter of correction to them. And I put down, I've used this for many years, but I put down the key points as to why it's important to take the Lord's Supper. Now, the first thing we realize that the reason we can do that is because of the born again experience, salvation we have in Jesus, that he brings us together as one. Now, many of the terms that's going to be used in uh, chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, from verses 16 to 17, has to do with the Greek word koinonia. And koinonia has so many meanings. It means to have things in common, to have communion, to communicate, to be a partaker, to contribute, to distribute, to have fellowship, a partner with one another. Now, one another is a real key word when it comes to the local church, uh, and especially at a time like this, that we are coming together in one accord as through Jesus. We're the members, he's the head, and we're part of his body, the body of Christ, the church. And it's that divine love, that agape love that infiltrates us and allows us to experience a miracle of koinonia with the Lord and with one another. And so that's an occasion. In fact, sometimes in the old days, they would call the Lord's Supper or communion time a love feast. It's a love feast of the Lord Jesus through the agape kind of love. So that's what uh, verse 16 says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. Of course, Jesus said he was the bread of life that came down from heaven. And for we are all partakers of that one bread. That's in John 6, 35. And then when we go over to chapter uh, 11... It's showing to us a, an act, a memorial of remembrance. So we're confessing his salvation. We're showing an act of fellowship, that koinonia. And uh, then it's a memorial. It's a memorial service. Now, memorial service is when the body's not present. That's what we call, uh, when we have modern day funerals today, when the body's not present at the funeral, it's called a memorial service. And consequently, uh, Jesus is here in spirit. He's the head of the body of Christ, but he's not here physically except through us. But he wanted the church to realize the importance of doing this, and then we're going to look at the acts of doing it, of being a partaker of this. So let's read uh, verses 24 through 34, and then we'll look at the uh, outline. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. 
This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Twice he said this. In remembrance. It's a memorial. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. So it's looking back at the time that he died for us. And it's also looking forward to the time when he's coming back for us in the second coming of the rapture. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, and to me that's not acknowledging sin in your life, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. I believe it's a sin of defaming the purpose of the cross and the blood when we do take this carelessly and we don't take it respectfully and we don't take it without repentance. We should be confessing and repenting up to date. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. There again, I, I believe it's a two-fold thing, the body of Christ plus his body that he sacrificed. For this cause, in verse 30, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That's premature physical death. So I believe we need to take this seriously with the Lord. Uh, it's a very sacred time with God. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And I believe here he's talking about accountability and responsibility with our lives. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. That means to be disciplined, corrected. That we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tear you one from another. For if any man hunger, let him eat at home. And you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. They were having an actual uh, dinner feast. And it was more worldly than it was spiritual, and Paul had to correct that problem. You cannot let problems, uh, especially when they're disobedient to the Word of God, continue on. They have to be corrected in your own life and in the corporate life of the body of Christ. Now, the act of remembrance is remembering his life, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, uh, and especially as he rebirthed us and resurrected us spiritually. Then we also realize this is an act of obedience. It's a permanent institution, an ordinance that he gave along with baptism, uh, the Lord's Supper. Communion was an ordinance that Jesus gave. So it's an obedient act, a permanent institution commanded to be regularly practiced. Some people do it weekly, some of them do it monthly, some of them do it quarterly. This church years ago had decided to do it quarterly, so we just kept that up. But no matter how many times you do it, when you do it, you need to do it right. Disobedience to this command is sinful and has its consequences, as we just read in the scriptures. Be faithful in taking it regularly. I would never ever try to find an excuse in my life not to be here when we're having Lord's Supper. It's that important. Not to just me as a pastor, but to God himself, to the Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's very important. It's an act of praise. It's an act of worship. Worship of joy and in joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And I like the way somebody spelled joy one time. You take J and O and Y, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. And that's a true statement about Christianity. It's to be done in faith, not in dead religious tradition. And I believe all denominations are guilty of this, not taking it seriously, but doing it traditionally. Dead tradition, especially. Now, traditionally, spirit-wise, doing it the way the Lord wants it to be done, that type of tradition is uh, sanctified. 
But when it's man-made denominational tradition, that's not sanctified by the Lord because it's man-made. So it has to be done spiritually right. And then we're doing this as a witness of his death. Why did he die? Why did he come? What did it do for us? What's the importance of it? It's a public witness of the gospel, of his death, the cruel, torturous, uh, sadistical type of death that Jesus went through on the cross. But thank God he promised the third day he would resurrect. And he would give to those all through this time after Jesus was resurrected that eternal resurrected life, saving, powerful, eternal resurrected life. So it's a witness of the resurrection in our own lives as well. And we look forward to the time when we will have a new body like Jesus has. Witness of his resurrection and changed lives of those partaking of this memorial. Now it's also, as he reminded us here, and uh, Jesus did it in all the Gospels, that... Uh, Someday we're going to be doing this with him in a different way. I believe during the millennial time, I don't know about eternity, but we'll see. It reminds us that Jesus is coming back. He promised that in John 14, 6. I will return. Can, any, can everybody say, praise the Lord, he's coming back. We've got something to look forward to. So we need to stay ready for his return. How do we do that? Well, keep your sins confessed up to date. Uh, repent of pet sins that you keep going back to. Uh, keep your heart sensitive to the Holy Spirit to witness to people, to tell others about Jesus, to share the gospel message. And I believe in doing that with tracts. Do that by the hundreds. Uh, God's opened up such a wonderful opportunity in Calhoun County with 16 businesses that have tracts that we've supplied that give people the gospel message. And they're just sitting there waiting for people to take up. And these people in these businesses tell me they're picking them up by the hundreds. So I thank God for that open door of sharing the good news. And... Uh, we need to tell people that Jesus is coming back. I believe you're in a time now where lost people out in the world are wondering what's fixing to happen. There's a lot of fear. A lot of uh, people, they, we don't know what's happening. It's the fear of the unknown. Uh, the thing about it is a lot of folks need to uh, have a respect for God uh, respect for his authority and his son, the Lord Jesus, and what he did for them on the cross. But you don't see a lot of that today. I don't see a lot of fear of God with people. I see a lot of people having fear of things and fear of their future, but they need to have a fear of God. That's where we come in. We can tell them that Jesus is going to come back. And let me tell you why we need to tell them. There's a judgment coming. Just think all these thousands of years the Lord has waited and waited and waited to stop all this evil and to change everything. And we know the book of uh, Peter tells us he's going to change it by fire. It's going to be a miraculous thing of change that will take place when the end comes. But until the end comes, what are we to be doing? You're to be faithful. How do you do that? Well, you're faithful with your, your money. Are you putting it to work with the gospel? Uh, you're faithful with your prayers. You're faithful with your church attendance. You're faithful with your witnessing. You're faithful with uh, winning people to Christ when God opens that door up. You're faithful to obey the word of God. You're faithful to claim his promises for your lives and your loved ones. 
So we need to always be faithful until the Lord comes. Are you faithful to be available as God's witness, his missionary? Uh, where will you go if he sends you? You say, I will, I will go if you let me know where that person is that you want me to witness to, that you want me to, to share the message with. And you do that, first of all, with your life. Let me tell you something. The way that you and I live is being watched. You're being watched by your family, relatives, friends, neighbors, people you do business with, whatever it is. You are being listened to. And what people need to hear from us, what people need to see in us, is that Jesus is the Savior. He's real that judgment is coming on this world and we need to be prepared that there is a hell to avoid and a heaven to obtain and we have the message so we cannot be silent with our lives and with proclaiming with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord he's the Savior and he's coming back and he's going to bring judgment on this world and we need to be ready and we need to have our family ready if you've got people that are lost we need to be praying for their salvation. Keep their name before the Lord. Never give up on people. Thank God Jesus didn't give up on us. Can anybody say amen? amen. So we're looking for his coming. He's coming back to us. And then in verse 27 and 34, we need to look at the Lord's Supper as a time for us to renew our commitment and relationship with Jesus. Are you committed? Totally committed. How can you tell? Is self first in your life and Jesus gets the leftovers? Is that where it is? You can always tell about your money, your time, and, and whatever you're doing in your life if Jesus is first or not. The evidence is in your life. A lot of people, I think, are in self-denial. Well, I'm okay. I go to church you know, and this and that. Where is your personal commitment to being a personal witness for Jesus out here in the world? What are you putting your money and your time in, your talents in? Jesus should be first. He's preeminent. He's king. He's Lord. Not you and I. Jesus is the one that saved us. And he says, come and follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Amen? So that's why it's a time to renew ourselves. We need spiritual checkups. We, uh, most of us go to the doctor at least once a year uh, to get blood work done and spiritual checkups, not spiritual checkups, but physical medical checkups. And if you've got a born again doctor, you can get a spiritual checkup too. So we need spiritual checkups. We need the Holy Spirit doing a, an examination down into the self-life. Is self first or is Jesus first? We need to have a spring in our step and a song in our heart that Jesus is Lord, he's in control, and I'm trusting him and I'm loving him and I'm obeying him and following him. We need God's good word in our heart, our lives, coming out of our mouth to share with people that he puts into our lives. And many times it'll be a stranger. And those are so wonderful times. There's been times that I have absolutely been privileged to lead somebody to the Lord that I never met before in my life except that one experience. And people get saved. It's a miracle. An absolute miracle when that happens. And that's why I am so sold out on the spread of the gospel message, the word of God, Everywhere I can go. Okay, so I would look then as uh, the Lord's Supper being a time of renewal because my heart, my life, needs spiritual renewals all the time. Some people call them revivals. I know this. Right now, in our country, in our city, our county, our state, our local church needs revival. We need a spiritual renewal, a new touch of God 
to move into our lives, to get us busy with his work. Self must come second. Jesus and his life and his work must come first. And all you got to do is look in your own heart and your own life and see if that's true or not. And if you're honest with God, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you and show you areas of your life that you need renewed with God in. So you can become a better disciple and more effective witness because self has to be on the back burner. Can anybody say amen? amen. We don't like to hear that because we're so comfortable in coddling that old self life and all of its wants and desires to please it first. But you're going to face Jesus someday for every decision you've made, for everything you've done, that self came first and Jesus was put on the back burner. He's going to bring it up. When the judgment seat of Christ comes, he's going to bring it up. And he's going to show you this is what you didn't do. You see, there's sins of omission and sins of commission. Omission means you left out that which was most important, and that was a sin to God when you left it out because you willfully did it. And sins of commission are those sins that you went along with, said, yes, I want to do that. And you got into the flesh and you let your flesh life, your old sinful nature rule and you started using your body, your soul to sin with, to come against God's kingdom work and what he wants with your life. Would you bow with me? Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have today to take this communion with a pure heart, a clear conscience, with confession and repentance of known sin and of those secret sins, that today's the day we cough them up. Today's the day that we get honest with you and say, Lord, I've been laxed. I've been putting too much of my time, my money, my talents, everything you've given to me on self, pleasing self first. Lord, forgive me. Help me. Help me, Lord. And Father, renew us. Fill us again with your Holy Spirit. Fill us again with their desire to share your word, to make that number one in our lives, that others can come to know you. And we want to thank you for it, and we praise you for it, because we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. And everybody said...